Now I have to um, get myself into a different uh, mode. Um, let me say that it is uh, an honor to be here this evening. Okay. Is that, is that better? I think so. Okay. And this is my second public address in six days. So let me once again thank the Cornelia Goethe Center for Women and Gender Studies for having established a guest professorship in my name, and especially for having invited me to be the first to hold this professorship. I could not have known that this event would coincide with the death of Nelson Mandela. And as I said to my students yesterday, one does not conduct business as usual when such an exceptional moment occurs. And so I would like to say a few words about uh, Nelson Mandela since we are gathered here uh, this evening. He was an extraordinary fighter for freedom for many reasons, but perhaps most of all for his humility and for his unrelenting insistence on community and on collective agency. When he was asked how he wanted to be remembered, he always said that he wanted to be remembered as one of many other men and women who contributed to our ongoing struggles for freedom. Nelson Mandela's life has exemplified what it means to define one's presence on the planet as enabling the expansion of freedom. He and his African National Congress comrades identified early on with nonviolent modes of resistance. But when it became apparent that nonviolence only works within a context in which the oppressors are receptive to such appeals. They founded the armed wing of the organization Unkontowe Siswe, Spear of the Nation. It was clear to them that the apartheid government could not be budged in any other way. Now, dominant representations of Mandela see his 27 years in prison where he was prisoner number 46664 as transforming him somehow into a proponent of nonviolence, uh, softening him, so to speak, uh, following Gandhi and Martin Luther King, whose media representations have been um, tailored so as comfortably to fit into a frame defined by liberalism. In 1985, five years before he was ultimately released, the apartheid regime offered Mandela his freedom if only he would renounce violence. In declining this, this offer, Mandela said in a statement his daughter issued that the apartheid government was the party that needed to renounce violence. Besides, he says, one can only negotiate if one is free. Prisoners cannot enter into contracts. Mandela is often portrayed as one who was willing to forgive and forget forgive and forget. His relationship with de Klerk, his friendship with one of the guards from Robben Island who was invited to attend his um, wedding to Grasa Machel, his relationship to the then all-white Springbok rug rugby union team, which, as you know, won the World Cup in uh, 1995. In all of these relationships, he compelled transformation. Yes, he did offer his hand to them, but he also called for something in return. They could not remain the same proponents or beneficiaries 
of apartheid. They would have to begin the process of purging themselves and their society of racism, exploitation, and violence. This was the meaning of the peace and reconciliation process, not simple forgiveness, not forgetfulness, but transformation, revolutionary transformation of self and transformation of social relations. I will remember Nelson Mandela, Madiba as we learned to call him, because he was a true revolutionary. He and his comrades demanded the overthrow of the apartheid state. And while post-apartheid South Africa continues to be plagued with a host of problems, that does not negate their extraordinary achievements. Uh, with solidarity from all over the world, even when the US government treated Mandela as a pariah and as a terrorist, they were victorious. And Mandela continues to represent a promise, a promise of revolution and transformation today. He has been a major inspiration for me as long as I can remember. His comrade, Albie Sachs, who was, of course, the jurist uh, who sat on the Constitutional Court and helped to uh, draft the new South African Constitution, which parenthetically is anti-racist, anti-sexist, and innovatively anti-homophobic. Albie Sachs uh, remarked that in many other parts of the world, people expect South Africans to be sad about the passing of their leader. But he said, in South Africa, people are joyous. They are singing and they are dancing and they are celebrating his legacy because they know that his legacy, which courses through uh, the, 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 the bodies and uh, the hearts of so many millions of people all over the planet, is far more powerful than his individual body. And so they are happy that they can offer his legacy to all of Africa and indeed to the world. I must admit that initially I was somewhat sad for myself. Uh, and that sadness emanated from not being among my usual communities. Uh, um, but in the days that I've been here in Frankfurt, I feel as if I have made new connections with new communities here at the university and beyond. We need memorials without closures. And so it is an honor to help memorialize Nelson Mandela among you. Thank you. The title of my talk comes from a song that emerged during the mid 20th century freedom movement. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we've struggled so long. We must be free. We must be free. The other verses of this song evoke crying and sorrow and moaning and dying. They say freedom is a constant dying. We've died so long. We must be free. I like the irony of the last line of each of the verses. We struggle so long. We've cried. We've sorrowed. We've moaned. We've died so long. We must be free. We must be free. There is simultaneously resignation and promise in this line. There is critique and inspiration. We must be free. We must be free. But are we really free? 
This is a talk about the effort to memorialize key moments in the US black liberation movement. And the way these efforts shape and contort historical memory. This is a talk about the attempted substitution of formal rights for substantive freedoms. But before I address these issues, let me tell you a, a story. Last February, which we celebrate each year as Black History Month, I spoke, as I usually do, at, um, at an elementary school in the city where I live. Uh, this time it was a fourth grade class. Uh, and I should tell you that the teacher introduced me as something like an artifact of black history. Because <laughs> I've been around for a long time. <laughs> so the first thing the children wanted to know was, did you ever meet Martin Luther King? <laughs> and I said, yes, I've met him several times. Did you ever meet Nelson Mandela? Yes, I actually stayed at his house during my first visit to South Africa. Did you meet Rosa Parks? Yes, on several occasions. What about Malcolm X? Yes, I met him when I was a college student. And then someone said, did you ever meet Harriet Tubman? <laughs> and uh, so that kind of... Uh, uh, caught me. I was taken aback, and so I said, no, I never met Harriet Tubman, and actually, I could not have met her. Uh, does anyone know why? <laughs> and this particularly astute uh, um, young boy in the class said, because she died in 1913. Uh, uh, I was impressed. I was totally impressed. Uh, uh, and this was certainly better than the previous time I had spoken at that uh, elementary school when someone asked me, one of the kids asked me whether I had been a slave. So my first impression was that these questions were indicative of the lack of historical education in US schools, especially in poor black communities. But as I thought about it, I realized that, yes, that might well be the case, but it occurred to me that there was a major kernel of truth in the children's questions. Because we inhabit our histories. We live inside our histories. And our histories inhabit us, even when we do not realize it. We live with the ghosts of our histories. And so I could have said, yes, I met Harriet Tubman. <laughs> and since I directly benefited from her work as an Underground Railroad conductor and as a Civil War soldier and spy, you might also say that I was a slave as well. Harriet Tubman died, as the young boy pointed out, in 1913, two months before, uh, two months um, after the birth of Rosa Parks. They shared the planet uh, for, for two months together. And, of course, her name is generally acknowledged as one of the major figures of the black freedom movement, what is usually referred to as the black civil rights movement. But she is so exceptionalized that we fail to grasp the part played by masses of women. And so how can we counteract the representation of historical agents as powerful individuals who are, for the most part, male, in order to reveal the part played, for example, by black women domestic workers in what we know as the black freedom movement. Regimes of racial segregation were not 
disestablished, primarily because of the work of presidents and legislators, but rather because of the fact that ordinary people adopted a critical stance in the way they perceived their relationship to reality. And I was talking about that critical uh, stance uh, uh, during the interview uh, portion of uh, this evening. Social realities that might have appeared inalterable, impenetrable, came to be viewed as malleable and transformable, and people learned how to imagine what it might mean to live in a world that was not so exclusively governed by the principle of white supremacy. This collective consciousness, this collective imagination of ordinary people emerged, of course, within the context of social struggles. It has been argued that the very concept of freedom, which has inspired world historical revolutions, must have first been imagined by slaves. During the era of the 20th century, during the era of the 20th century black freedom movement, the human beings whose predicament most approximated that of slaves were black women domestic workers. As a matter of fact, in the 1950s in the US, some 90% of all black women were domestic workers. Given the fact that the majority of people who rode the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, 1955, you're familiar with the Montgomery bus boycott. Given the fact that the majority of people were black women domestic workers, uh, why is it so difficult to acknowledge what must have been among them a wondrous collective imagination of a world without racial, gender, and economic oppression? Uh, we tend to think about Dr. Martin Luther King as the towering figure of that movement. Yet he was rather small then. He was new and unknown and was invited to be the spokesperson of that boycott primarily because he did not oppose any competition to the other ministers in Montgomery. Why is it so difficult to recognize the role that ordinary people, poor black women, played in the mid-century black freedom movement? Less than 10 years after the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, on September 15, 1963, an explosion destroyed the lower floor of one of the largest black churches in Birmingham, Alabama, and four young black girls between the ages of 11 and 14 were killed. 22 were wounded, including the sister uh, of one of the dead girls, um, Sarah Collins, a sister of Addie Mae Collins, who lost an eye. As you heard, Birmingham, Alabama is the city where I grew up. And as I've said many times, some of my earliest childhood memories, my, my earliest childhood memories, I think, are, uh, are, are oral. They are the sounds of bombs, the sounds of explosions, set off by the Ku Klux Klan. So many bombings took place in the neighborhood where I grew up um, that the neighborhood came to be called Dynamite Hill. It's still called Dynamite Hill. And the city of Birmingham was known as Bombingham. In fact, on September 4th, 1963, less than two weeks before the 16th Street Church bombing, the home of the most prominent civil rights attorney uh, in that neighborhood was bombed. Two other black youth were killed, two boys. Uh, one was shot by the police when he refused to stop running after the police caught him uh, throwing stones at white people who were driving through the black neighborhood, taunting uh, with slogans like, like two, four, six, 
eight, we don't want to integrate. And the other, a 13-year-old, was simply playing in a neighborhood outside of the city when white boys shot him for no other reason than that he sat on the handlebars of a bicycle and that he was black and an easy target. Bombings plagued black communities in Birmingham before and after September 15, 1963. And many people, including the FBI, knew exactly who was behind them. Uh, at the time, the ringleader of the group that had planted the bomb was arrested and was, was simply charged with possession of dynamite and given a hundred dollar fine and I think six months in jail, something like that. And because the FBI refused to reveal the evidence that they had gathered against the perpetrators, as a matter of fact, it was J. Edgar Hoover, who was still the head of the FBI when I was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted lists. Uh, uh, and as a result of Hoover's actions, no charges, no federal charges were ever brought. And of course, the collusion between the state of Alabama and the Ku Klux Klan was acknowledged, but the profound involvement of the federal government still remains to be acknowledged. It was not until the year 2000 40 years almost after the bombing, that the federal government announced that they knew exactly who had uh, instigated the bombing. It was a Ku Klux Klan faction called the Cahaba Boys. Uh, and in the year 2000, almost 40 years after, 37 years after it happened, uh, the FBI released the evidence against particular individuals. Uh, now this year, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the bombing, a series of memorial events took place, including the awarding of the highest civilian honor to the families of the girls who were killed. They received the Congressional Gold Medal. And that was good. But what I fear is that so many of the fifth, so many of the anniversary observances, uh, uh, not only the semi-centennial observances, uh, but also the sesquicentennial observances, the Emancipation Proclamation, et cetera, um, are designed literally to close the book on um, the racist violence of what we know as the civil rights era in the US, so that it can be embalmed and transformed into something to be gazed at through the conventional lens of the museum. And so the question is how to resist this temptation of historical abstraction and ex exceptionalization. How easy it is to think about the four innocent young black girls whose lives were violently taken by evil white supremacists. And I am not arguing that this is not what happened. What I am saying is that it is a lot more complicated and if we do not understand the complexity of this historical event, we will certainly not be capable of comprehending the violence, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic violence which continues to erupt in our lives today. Resisting the temptation of historical abstraction requires us to realize that this was not an extraordinary event that erupted one Sunday morning 50 years ago in an otherwise peaceful city. And therefore, in memorializing the four girls, we should not exceptionalize the act, uh, which unfortunately has happened repeatedly. As much talk as there has been about terrorism over the last decade, since 9-11, September 11, uh, 2001, I have not heard 
one official acknowledgement of the terrorism that prevailed in places like Birmingham. Terrorism is an integral aspect of the history of the United States from the era of slavery to the present. Terrorism is not primarily situated outside the US, whose imperialist violence has always been complemented by domestic violence. Uh, and this relates to the discussion we were having during the interview about racism within and racism without. Uh, 1898, for example, Cuba, the Philippines, Hawaii, but also black communities in Wilmington, North Carolina, precisely at the same time. As um, H. Rat Brown famously proclaimed uh, some 40 years ago, violence is as American as apple pie. There is something else that has been excised from the historical record, and that is the fact that um, black people armed themselves. Uh, uh, even Condoleezza Rice, you remember her? Uh, <laughs> even Condoleezza Rice has described her minister father as being a leader of an armed patrol of black men in her neighborhood. Um, I mean, my, my father was also a member of an armed patrol. But as Condoleezza Rice pointed out uh, during the course of these um, uh, uh, memorials, she said, no one was ever shot. She said that her father's patrol may have fired guns in the air to scare Ku Klux Klan types away, but no one was ever hurt. And when I heard her say that, my question was, why didn't she learn this lesson about ways to respond to so-called terrorism? <laughs> she could have used that lesson during her tenure uh, as uh, <laughs> Secretary of State and Security Advisor. <laughs> and then perhaps we would have avoided the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh. But just as um, um, the sediments of slavery are still with us, most dramatically represented by incarceration practices in the US and the racism of the death penalty. The vestiges of an era where racist violence was the norm and was condoned by officials from local governments to the White House are still haunting us. Uh, this current era is characterized as a post-civil rights era, post-racial as well, and a lot of posts. Um, victories in the arena of civil rights are considered to be complete. And so I want to challenge this assumption in two ways. First of all, many groups of people who have not been able to fully access their civil rights can be pointed to. Uh, prisoners, for one, uh, there are some 2.5 million people behind bars who have no access to a whole range of civil rights. Uh, LGBT communities, for example, who have no access to a range of civil rights as well, although uh, uh, the, the, the right to marry, which is a civil right, is increasingly uh, uh, being legitimized. Uh, uh, and I can say parenthetically that, uh, that, that while it may be important to defend such civil rights, that does not prevent us from also challenging the institution of marriage. Uh, 
uh, which is, uh, which I think was one of the, the, the most important contributions of the early feminist movement. Uh, and also the civil rights of immigrants. Uh, as a matter of fact, struggles for the rights of immigrants are among the most significant civil rights struggles of the 21st century. If 20th century civil rights struggles were not necessarily linked to resistance to capitalism, although some of us did try to make uh, that connection, the growth of global capitalism over the last decades uh, has compelled us to link the denial of civil rights to significant numbers of people to an intensification of capitalism during the era of its globalization and the consequent prioritization of profit over people. But there is also the larger question of the limits of civil rights, the limits of rights and rights strategies and rights discourses. One may make the same observation about civil rights that Gayatri Spiva made about human rights as that which we cannot not want that which we cannot not want. But at the same time, it is necessary to resist efforts to enact closures around the achievement of civil rights. Certainly, achievements in the arena of civil rights have not necessarily led in the direction of substantive forms of freedom. Civil rights are abstract rights, they are formal rights, and they have not necessarily led to jobs and education and healthcare and other services that are necessary for the attainment of more substantive forms of freedom. Civil rights have not prevented the mass incarceration that constitutes what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, and what abolitionist scholar activists refer to as the prison industrial complex. And civil rights have not prevented racist violence from erupting time and time again. Moreover, the pathway to civil rights for millions of black people has involved civil death. Rights are recognized precisely in order to be taken away by the legal process and subsequent imprisonment which consists in civil death, that is to say depriving the subject of those rights that are recognized in democratic society. And this contemporary process can be traced back to slavery and what um, uh, Cheryl Harris has pointed to as the paradoxical legal definition of the slave. Uh, we discussed this in the class yesterday. I see some of my students are, are here. Uh, uh, Cheryl Harris uh, points out that uh, um, while slaves were legally defined as property, there was also legal accountability. And how can property have agency? Um, thus, there was agency and limited legal personality accorded to the slave so that she or he could be found guilty and punished. So slaves were property except when they were found guilty of the commission of a crime. And so later we see the deployment of civil rights to legitimize culpability in order to relegate the person to a state of civil death. 
And as I was saying, civil rights victories have not prevented the continued eruption of racist violence. Um, in the US, we can name scores and scores of, of primarily young uh, black and brown people who have been killed by the police or by vigilantes. Uh, you, know, you, you know the name of Trayvon Martin in Florida. There's Hydea um, Pendleton in Chicago, Oscar Grant in Oakland, California, where I live. And it should be pointed out that racial profiling and racial violence committed by police officers is not related, unrelated, is not unrelated to vigilante violence. And vigilante violence is not unrelated to gang violence. And gang violence is not unrelated to um, intimate violence. And I wish I had the time to explore all of those connections, but unfortunately now I can only um, evoke it. And some of you were here Tuesday, where I tried to make uh, some of those connections uh, somewhat more ex explicitly. But let me say that since I've been in Frankfurt, I've had the opportunity to meet with um, inspiring anti-racist activists. And, and I, I've learned since I've been here about a number of cases. Uh, and so I can add to the names of the um, victims in the US that I've called the, the name of um, Christy Schwundek, uh, who uh, was shot to death here in Frankfurt at a job center uh, by a police woman. It should be pointed out. And then there is a case uh, that happened somewhat earlier in Dessau of uh, Uri Jalu, uh, who was an asylum seeker who died in official custody while handcuffed and shackled to a bed. Apparently, he, uh, he was burned to death after the mattress was set on fire, and although experts have demonstrated that with his uh, hands cuffed down, he could not have possibly started the fire, his death was officially considered a suicide, like so many deaths in custody of people of color all over the world. And I mention this because I've, I've uh, discovered that there is um, a demonstration in Dessau on January, am I right, January 7th, January 7th? And uh, since there's a nice community of people here, perhaps uh, there's some literature that can be passed out so that some of you can participate in that. Yeah. I, I must admit that I'm very much accustomed to hearing about racist murders in the US. I've been hearing about these cases all my life. Uh, uh, you know, from uh, the time I was a child. Trayvon Martin is the most widely known recent case, but he's just the, the tip of an iceberg. Perhaps I can be accused of naivete, but even though I have been aware of the problem of racism here, um, I was friends with Audre Lorde and followed uh, uh, the uh, uh, developments here uh, uh, through her, but I did not expect to hear so many stories that are so similar to what is happening in the U.S. Uh, and on the one hand, as I explained to the um, activists with whom I met a few days ago, I, it, it provokes uh, this profound feeling of sadness. Uh, 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 you know, how can it be that uh, this violence will not go away, and it seems to be proliferating. But I'm also inspired and encouraged by the 
movements of resistance that have developed around these two cases and, and, and many other cases and around the issues of refugees uh, here in uh, Germany. And when I think about uh, this um, violence, uh, I realize that the problem is so much vaster than simply uh, persuading people not to commit these acts of violence. Even if we could rest assured that there were no more racist vigilantes or no more police who use racial profiling, uh, and I understand that their, their efforts to um, create a, a, um, a vocabulary in German to capture uh, uh, like racial profiling, for example. Uh, uh, and we talk about stop and frisk in, in the US. Uh, but even if we, had, we were able to eliminate these practices, there would still remain the structural violence of the educational system, the economic violence that de denies jobs to so many people of color, or forces them to work for minimum wage or less. Uh, and that is the violence that reaps violence. Uh, and I think in the US about the, the, the explosive violence directed against Muslims. Uh, uh, and the numbers of Muslims who have been killed in the US uh, since September 11th, 2001 is astounding without any official acknowledgement of the way anti-black racism and racism against indigenous people in the US uh, serves as a foundation upon which new racisms uh, and new modes of violence, uh, and particularly Islamophobic uh, violence, anti-Muslim violence. And unfortunately, the solutions that tend to be offered, especially to the problems of violence in communities of color, um, involve more police, more guns, more violence. Uh, it is absolutely amazing that there are some 300 million civilian guns in the United States. 94.3 guns per 100 residents. That means there's almost one gun for every person in the country. And we're not even talking about the guns in the hands of the police. And parenthetically, we're talking about gun control, but we should also be talking about disarming the police uh, and eventually disarming the military. You know, what a democracy. What a democracy. There are more guns in the US than anywhere else in the world, just as there are more prisoners than anywhere else in the world. Uh, um, if you compare the US and Palestine, the U.S. has 94.3 guns for every 100 residents, while Palestine, which is always imagined as one of the most violent places in the world, has 3.4 guns for every 100 residents. The U.S. is number one in the world in terms of uh, gun ownership. Palestine is number 118. And keep in mind that Palestinians have been fighting one of the most important struggles for peace, equality, and human dignity for many decades. And that many of the young activists in Palestine are inspired by the stories of the black freedom movement in the US, uh, including Palestinian freedom riders riding buses on, riding segregated buses or attempting to ride segregated buses down segregated highways uh, 
uh, inspired by the Black Freedom Rides in the U.S. in the 1960s. And if you think the door has been closed on racial segregation with the triumph of the civil rights movement in the U.S. and the downfall of apartheid in South Africa, visit Palestine and witness, and witness the extent to which 19th and 20th century apartheid practices of the Deep South continue to live on uncontested in the Israeli occupation of Palestine. One of the lessons we've learned from feminist theories and activists is that in attempting to understand any phenomenon, we have to strive to understand the, connection that, the connections that link it to other issues, especially those that seem to have no relation to the issue at hand. It used to be said that race had nothing to do uh, uh, with gender or that sexuality had nothing to do with class, but we've learned that race is always gendered, sexuality is always classed, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we go further? We assume that gang violence has nothing to do with police violence, or that police violence has nothing to do with domestic or intimate violence, or the violence that consumed the lives of the four young girls in Birmingham, Alabama 50 years ago has nothing to do with the violence that consumes the lives of young people of color today. Violence, it seems to me, may be thought as involving a pervasive inability to imagine the future. And in many ways, violence is a solution that isolates the present from the future. A solution that precludes future possibilities, whether the economic future, cultural future of a community, or the future of a family, whatever its uh, configuration might be. Uh, but there have been moments of promise, moments of imagining a better future, moments of a cessation of violence. In Washington, D.C., on the day of the first inauguration of Barack Obama, there was not a single crime committed in the entire city of Washington, D.C. And if you know anything about Washington, uh, you know that that is absolutely extraordinary. Be because that was a moment when vast numbers of people understood the historical meaning of that moment, the convergence of past and present struggles that produced a momentary but pervasive and collective vision of the future. Unfortunately, we did not act on that vision. Had we been able to move forward and build a more powerful movement, we might have captured the imagination of so many of the young people whose lives have been claimed by gun violence in the US. But what we did not accomplish then helps to create agendas for the present. And so, with respect to the freedom movement, which I have been talking about, there is an attempt to co-opt it and to um, fit it into a much smaller frame, into, into the frame of civil rights. Not that civil rights is not immensely important, but freedom is so much more expansive than civil rights. And as this, that movement, the freedom movement, known today uh, as the civil rights movement, grew and developed, it was inspired by and in turn inspired liberation struggles in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Australia. Freedom is so much more capacious than civil rights. But dominant discourse attempts to confine freedom to a civil rights frame and thus to maintain it within the borders of liberalism. Even Mandela has been referred to as a civil rights activist. Uh, and that seems quite bizarre uh, to me. Freedom is not only a question of acquiring the formal rights to fully participate in society, but rather in the US it, was, it has also been about 
the 40 acres and a mule that dropped out of the abolitionist agenda in the 19th century. It was also about free education and free health care and affordable housing. And these agendas are very much related to anti-colonial agendas, both within and beyond the US, uh, uh, within in terms of Native American sovereignty uh, struggles, uh, and also about ending racist, the racist police occupation of communities of color. And so in the 1960s, um, uh, there were organizations other than civil rights organizations. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the primary reason why I returned to the US in, in 1967 was because of the creation of the Black Panther Party. I was uh, you know, very much um, mesmerized by that. And of course, there's rarely any effort to integrate the Black Panther Party into a narrative of increasing democracy in, 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 in the US, as has been the case with the struggles that are characterized as civil rights struggles. And if one looks at the, the what was called the 10-point program of the Black Panther Party, you get a sense why, uh, uh, because that 10-point program involves precisely these more substantive uh, 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 issues we're referring to. And I'll just, uh, just very briefly uh, summarize each of the 10 points. The first one is freedom, two, full employment, three, an end to the robbery of, by the capitalists of black and oppressed communities, decent housing, decent education, free health care, immediate end to police brutality and murder, immediate end to all wars of aggression, freedom for all black and oppressed people held in US federal, state, county, city, military prisons and jails. And finally, number 10, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, peace, and people's community control of modern technology. This was, a, this was a, a, an agenda developed in 1966, and it's, it resonates uh, so clearly today. This program recapitulated abolitionist agendas of the, of the 19th century, and it continues to resonate in the 21st century. Interestingly, the Black Panther Party was founded in 1966, and so three years from now, we will be observing the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party. Uh, or will we? Yeah. Acknowledging continuities between 19th century anti-slavery struggles, 20th century civil rights struggles, and 21st century abolitionist struggles requires a challenge to the closures that isolate the freedom movement of the mid 20th century from the century preceding and the century following. But it is incumbent upon us not only to recognize these temporal continuities, but to recognize horizontal continuities, links with a range of social struggles today. And we might use the concept of intersectionality to talk of not only of intersectionality of uh, modalities of power, but intersectionality of resistance struggles as well. Abolish prisons, abolish the structures of racism that have fueled the highly profitable prison industry. Abolish the sexism that is at the core of the prison industry, as well as the homophobia and transphobia that is regularly reanimated by the prison industry. There are connections with movements against persisting colonialities with labor movements and with anti-capitalist efforts throughout the world, with calls for free education and free health care. There are connections with the food justice movement and demands to end the suffering of animals uh, in the industrial capitalist modes of food production. And there are connections with movements against war and movements to preserve the environment. But the list continues, and my time has come to an end. Um, so I think I, would, I will simply ask Nelson Mandela to have the last word. I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way. 
But I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Davis, for your inspiring talk and for giving us the chance to commemorate Man Lance and Mandela. And what I learned tonight is to watch out for misleading historical abstractions and to look at all forms of injustice very concretely, whether they are legal, whether they are economical or social, in an intersectional manner and to be made aware of the deep meaning of freedom and what it all entails. So thank you very much again. As the presenter of this um, debate now, I would like to introduce you. Uh, first, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Margaret Brückner. I come from the Fachhochschule Frankfurt, the University of Applied Sciences in Frankfurt. And I would like to present you to the four discussions we have here on the panel. And all four of the young uh, discussants work on their dissertations on topics that are close uh, to the work of Angela Davis and they have occupied themselves a lot with her work. First, I want to introduce then I want to start on my right, on your left, with Nadine Gorley. Nadine Gorley is a social scientist, a researcher, and a lecturer at Leuphana University in Lüneburg and at the Institute for Integrative Studies, the Faculty of Education. Her research and teaching areas are black diasporan studies in Europe, Postcolonial theory and education for sustainable development, critical theory, gender, and lots of other topics. And she's a member of the Association of Black People in Germany and a member of a Black Trainers Collective. And she is affiliated in Frankfurt to the Research Center of Postcolonial Studies since its very beginning. 
Her PhD deals with the mostly forgotten aspect of post-World War II European history, that is, black children and their trajectories within and between European countries. And she wants to examine how this group of black people modifies European historiography. On my left, on your right, Maria Teresa Herrera Vivar. She is a PhD candidate in sociology at the international program, which is called Democracy, Knowledge, and Gender in a Transnational World at the Goethe University here. And her PhD project is looking on activist practices of Latin American undocumented women in Germany with a focus on, on how they create new forms of belonging and how these processes are related to the formation of political subjectivities. Her research interests include critical migration studies, post-colonial theories and methodologies, and queer studies. And she is affiliated to here the Cornelia Goethe Center of Women and Gender Studies and to the Frankfurt Research Center of Postcolonial Studies. Now I come to my far right, your far left, Luis Manuel Hernandez Aguilar. He was uh, born in Mexico City and he received his BA degree in sociology with honors at the Metropolitan Autonomous University in Mexico City, where his thesis was on racism in urban spaces and it won the first prize. And then he did his MA in social sciences at the Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences Campus Mexico where his thesis was about indigenous social movements and racism. And currently, he also is a PhD student at the Goethe University here in Frankfurt at the program Democracy, Knowledge and Gender in a Transnational World. And he's working on his dissertation entitled Islamphobia, Neo-Racism or Just Racism. And he looks at issues of racism in institutions from a post-colonial perspective. And now I would like to introduce you to the first discussion, Zuber Ahmad. He holds a master degree in political science from the Goethe University Frankfurt and is currently also a PhD candidate, but at the Free University of Berlin. And his research interests include modern political theory, particularly he's interested in questions of religion, secularism and modernity, as well as in race and intersectionality, post and decolonial thinking. His research focuses on Germany's recent politics on Islam, and he aims at writing a post-colonial genealogy of the governmental approach to Islamic communities and Muslim subjectivities in Germany. So now we would like to start with the first discussant, and that is to my right, my right Nadine, please. Thank you very much. Um, dear Professor Davis, I want to say thank you on behalf of all the panelists for being here, for being with us, for us having the possibility to learn from and with you, and for the possibility to ask questions, to understand and to grow. Thank you. My first question, I don't know if I get another one, but <laughs> at least. <laughs> yeah, we have to do it. <laughs> Due to the time. Um, while we were preparing for tonight, but also uh, for studying with you, we were watching videos from speeches you hold, and we st stumbled across all the hate you encounter. And the same applies for a lot of black people and people of color, no matter if in the US or in Germany. We face a lot of hate as soon as we go public. It starts with labeling processes such as terrorist or communist, and it ends with death threats. There's the demand to constantly struggle to survive. Um, we were wondering how can we respond to that hate and what are possibilities of resistance strategies? What are possibilities of self-care? Would you like to answer? Well, that's a 
a really deep question. Um, and to, to try to answer succinctly, um, I guess I might say that my approach has always been to try to, try to build stronger communities. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it's possible to avoid the um, expressions of, of, of hate. Uh, uh, and, and as you know, I've seen many of them over the years. As a matter of fact, during my um, trial, we had two huge notebooks of hate letters uh, uh, that, had, that were written to me during uh, the time of, uh, during the time I was teaching at UCLA during the course of just a few months. Uh, um, my sense is that one reacts to those kinds of efforts by building strong communities uh, and by, um, you know, sharing the, 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 the desire to resist. Uh, when I began to teach at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I was awarded a, uh, a presidential chair, some people thought I had become president of the University of California, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a presidential chair. You would be amazed at the hate mail and uh, the, the, the telephone calls that came from people who were very high up, including in the government. Uh, and fortunately, I had a very strong group of graduate students. Uh, and, and they said, don't worry, we will handle it. And so I didn't even have to respond. They did organizing, they wrote statements, and it, 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 it really made me recognize the, the power of, of the community. You can't prevent uh, the expressions uh, uh, of hate. You can't prevent the aggression, but you can uh, develop the kind of community that will uh, allow you to uh, move forward. <laughs> oh yes, and self-care. Self-care is important. Self-care is always important. Uh, um, so do you want me to tell you what I do for self-care? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I learned long ago that, uh, that, that one has to take care of one's body and one has to take care of um, one's spirit, so to speak. Uh, and I do all kinds of things. I like exercise. I, I practice yoga almost every day. And I meditate. Uh, and, uh, and we're trying to incorporate this into our activism so that it's not seen as a kind of elitist luxury. Uh, but the people who do practice that self-care are much more likely not to burn out, are much more likely to be involved for the long run. And for me, it's always been a question of a lifetime uh, uh, endeavor. You want to start? Yeah. Do we have one question each? Otherwise, I would, uh, would have to cho choose this. <laughs> it's, a question, it's a question to you, Ms. Davis, as well, and, and to the public how much longer we can do. But I think if you have a first round and then we have a look how long it lasts, yeah? Okay. Is that okay with you? Okay. Because we are much over time already. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, then I start. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, Professor Davis, if you could share uh, with us um, your experience on the topic of Palestine working there, uh, and maybe also your visits. Um, and the question related to that um, would also be, what would you suggest how to cope, so to say, with the difficulty to uh, think different experiences of atrocities uh, and violence as, a, as colonialism, slavery, the Nakba, uh, the Holocaust, the Mafa, uh, all together? And uh, would it not be part of a social movement or at least a social justice movement or a social justice approach um, to open the collective memory of all of these 
um, kind of um, atrocities uh, in terms of present, uh, in terms of past, but also in terms of what is uh, happening because of uh, that in the present. Um, okay, there are two questions, so I'll address the issue of Palestine, uh, first of all. And I suppose I should say that I've been active in efforts of um, Palestine solidarity since I was uh, quite young, since I was an undergraduate. Uh, and I often point out uh, when people ask me how I became involved in these struggles that I learned Palestine solidarity from my um, Jewish classmates at a Jewish university uh, back in the early 1960s. Uh, I had never been to Palestine, however, and I, um, I really thought I understood the, 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 the nature of the occupation because of the reading I had done, because of my contacts uh, with uh, um, uh, Palestinian scholars and activists. Uh, I often point out that when I was in jail, I received a, uh, a solidarity letter from prisoners, uh, Palestinian prisoners who were in an Israeli uh, jail. It was one of the most moving uh, um, communications I received because they had to smuggle it out of the jail and it had to be smuggled into the jail with me. But in, in any event, when I had the opportunity to visit Palestine uh, some uh, two and a half years ago with a delegation of um, um, feminist uh, scholar activists, indigenous uh, and women of color feminist scholar activists. I, um, I was just so shocked. I, you know, all that I knew, uh, with all that I knew, it became apparent that I knew nothing at all. And also uh, experiencing, uh, you know, the segregation there, it brought back uh, memories for all of us. Our delegation consisted of uh, people who had grown up in South Africa under South African apartheid, uh, women who had uh, grown up on the reservation uh, in, 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 the, in the U.S. And our response was, this is so much worse than our own experiences. Uh, so it was, it was really pivotal. It was mind-boggling uh, uh, for me. And since then, I've been, been working with uh, a number of different organizations, the Russell Tribunal on, on Palestine. As a matter of fact, I'm, uh, after I leave Frankfurt, I'm going to London to participate in an effort to uh, mobilize people to get involved in the campaign against G4S. And I'm not sure whether people have been involved in that effort here. Are you familiar with G4S? Hmm? Well, through the BDS, yeah, BDS has launched a campaign against G4S, which is a private, which is the largest private security company in the world. Uh, it uh, runs uh, many of the jails and prisons and the checkpoints and, and, and is responsible for the uh, a wall, in the separation wall. But at the same time, it um, runs juvenile facilities, juvenile schools in the U.S. and runs private prisons in the U.S. Uh, it is the large, it is the second largest private company in the world, second only to Walmart. It is the, the largest non-governmental employer on the continent of Africa. So we could go on and talk about the connections, but, 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 but this is the work that I'm uh, currently involved in, urging people to make connections uh, and to see that movement as, a, as, a, um, uh, as one of the most important movements of our, our time for freedom and, and dignity. Uh, and what was the other? 
the other was um, yeah the other was about the difficulty as it seems to me the difficulty to uh, think different atrocities yes, together right, yes exactly and, and that's that's a feminist challenge uh, 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 Elizabeth Martinez, uh, uh, Batita Martinez, a scholar activist in the U.S., uh, long ago counseled us to beware of oppression Olympics, to beware of oppression Olympics. Uh, and Jackie Alexander, who is uh, uh, a scholar who has uh, uh, done work in the realm of transnational feminism uh, has always insisted that we learn each other's stories, that that is an important element of, of feminist transnational uh, uh, struggles. And yes, uh, I absolutely agree that we have to find ways to bring those experiences together, to share those uh, stories, um, for those, those histories not to be considered the exclusive property of uh, the person whose lives have been more directly shaped by those historical experiences. Um, first of all, thanks uh, for the opportunity. And what I would like to ask you is, um, in your opinion, what are the contemporary challenges and difficulties cons uh, about rethinking racism and also fighting racism? Insofar, there are two processes. Uh, one you just mentioned it: the naive and dangerous, uh, but most and most popular idea of post-racial times is getting power. And on the other hand, the, the fact that racism by itself has found new ways to, to expand, new ways to, to, to perform, to act, subtler ways in, in which it's uh, entangling in our societies. And I just wanted to, to address also this, this thing the, in, the, in, the, in the interview that you have two days ago in the channel Dreizat, in the culture side, when the translator, when you emphatically say black, and the translator was saying farbic. Uh, for me, that was a kind of this particular process, these subtler ways in which it seems that there is not racism, but there is, insofar there is a politics of translation involved. So, f in your opinion, why, 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 what are these challenges, especially, especially in this time in which racism by itself is changing, and you have a master discourse saying that we have overcome uh, racism? Thank you. Well, there's so many arenas in which uh, one can detect and challenge uh, uh, racism. The, one of the problems we confront is that the definition of racism is rather frozen. The assumption is, uh, the prevailing assumption is that racism consists in what were the historical um, conditions of the U.S. South during the era of uh, the development of the freedom movement there, and the conditions in apartheid South Africa. And therefore, if, if in a given society one cannot identify uh, such examples of legal racism, then racism doesn't really exist, except perhaps in the minds of people. So you have this assumption that it's either legal, inscribed in the law, or else it's attitudinal. Now, the problem is when it's considered to be a, 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 a part of an individual's attitudes, then uh, that person is assumed to have a psychological problem. So there's a kind of a psychologization of racism. And now, of course, we have all kinds of uh, unlearning racism workshops. And you, know, you, you, you attend one of those, and you have purged yourself of racism. Uh, uh. 
And that actually is related to uh, the tendency to see the expressions of racist attitudes as exceptional within the context of a society where racism has been largely abolished. Uh, now, how does one define racism? How does one locate racism? How does one recognize racism? Uh, uh, those are complicated questions, but I do believe it is possible and important to develop a popular discourse that allows for the recognition of, of structural racism, um, uh, whether we are referring to institutions like educational institutions, uh, economic institutions. Uh, uh, in the US, we say the best example of the persistence of racism is the prison industrial complex and the overwhelming uh, disproportionate numbers of people of color uh, uh, in, in, in the prison system. But we can also refer to language, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, there's a, a structural presence of racism in the language. Uh, we continue to deal with that in the US. Uh, and I don't know how far uh, you've gotten here in uh, Germany. <laughs> 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 still have to learn a lot. <laughs> but it's a long process. Uh, but I think it is important to be vigilant and to develop ways of responding that don't um, place people on the defensive. You know, how, how can you uh, encourage people to get involved in anti-racist uh, struggles uh, by also encouraging them to recognize the extent to which they have been formed and informed by racist uh, uh, structures. And this is, this is an ongoing process. And people of color are not exempt from that as well. We also have to be aware of the extent to which ideology uh, uh, affects us all. We all live inside ideology. Thank you. Uh, Professor Davis, in your talk, you just mentioned um, the immigrant rights movement as one of the most important arenas for the struggle uh, for civil rights nowadays. And um, what do you think are the lessons we can learn from this movement um, um, concerning um, the issue of coalition building between communities of resistance? The struggle of of we, we use the term undocumented uh, immigrants, and, and this, is a, this was again a struggle about language uh, uh, because people without papers in France, I, the term sans papier is used, in the US are referred to as illegal aliens. <laughs> illegal aliens, uh, you know, what, how racist a term is that? Uh, but the, the movement organized by undocumented immigrants, young people, has been the most militant uh, movement of, of this era. And not only because of the, the, uh, the, the kind of massive support, particularly within Latino communities, uh, uh, but also because of the, what we might call the intersectionality of struggle. So there is the, the labor struggles. As a matter of fact, May 1st is um, Workers' Day, right? But in the US, May 1st is the day undocumented immigrants mobilize uh, all over the country. So they have basically taken over May 1st and, 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 and given it new meaning. But that means also that uh, they are very, that that movement is very conscious of its connection with, um, with the labor movement, with the radical labor movement, so that there's a connection there. Uh, there's also a connection uh, with LGBTQ 
Q movements, uh, you know, many, the process of coming out as undocumented has been um, very difficult. And, and, and this goes to your question about how do you respond to aggression? Uh, um, when a young person uh, reveals that she or he is without papers, uh, then that means that she or he is placed in this extremely vulnerable position of being uh, deported, of being the target of, 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 of hate violence. But that, that movement has made it possible for huge numbers of people not only to come out as undocumented immigrants, but to uh, uh, come out as gay or lesbian, uh, uh, that movement has also been responsible for doing so much work against violence. It's, uh, it's really what I would refer to as the most intersectional uh, movement of our times. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oops. I, it's vital. Maybe. We, we are running out of time, that's a problem. Um, so I would like to ask the four of you maybe if you would like to respond to something that Ms. Davis said just now and you want to put sort of that into a question, then we can have a, a short other round and then we need to finish. Is okay. that possible? That's a deal. Yeah. Um, I just because we're, people were laughing when uh, uh, it was said that uh, it's called illegal aliens in the U.S. I mean, it's the same term here in Germany, and even the authority who copes with non-Germans is called aliens authority. So it's not um, different. Um, yeah, as a response, but also as a further question. Uh, you talked a lot um, about the violence you were surrounded by white terror, and you wrote also a lot about it since you were a child, and you often said as violence is a part of our lives and imposed on us as it, ha it has to be part of our struggles, part of a, pa have to be part of a revolutionary process. On Tuesday you said in your talk, um, my weapons are my books, and I was Wondering, is that enough seeing how the state treats our people who write and read? We just think of Asata Shakur, we think of Mumia Abu Jamal and many other political prisoners of resistant communities. When did I say that? <laughs> In your talk on Tuesday. I did. Yes. Okay. I have witnesses. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I suppose uh, I wasn't, I didn't mean that they were exclusive uh, because I would, uh, I would also say that uh, our weapons are our bodies, you know, our weapons are our collective spirit, our weapons are our organizing, and I think organizing is often key, um, particularly when it comes to the defense of someone like Mumia Abu Jamal, who uh, uh, has been in prison for th over three decades, uh, and fortunately is no longer on death row, but precisely because of a massive organized international uh, campaign. Um, I think I would change that and I would say that the most important um, weapon, if we want to think in terms of uh, uh, those, that metaphor, is organizing, bringing people together. Uh, uh, and of course, many years ago when, when I was on, on trial, it was not uh, a given that I was going to be found not guilty, regardless of the fact that I was, was innocent. We were facing the most powerful forces in the, in the world. And many people thought that I was heading directly 
uh, to um, the gas chamber because I was charged with three capital crimes. And it was only because of the massive organizing all over the country, all over the world, that uh, we were able to uh, uh, prevent the will of the state from being carried out. So I, I think if I had to choose one among many weapons, I would say organizing. Thank you very much. The last one. The last one. So we would like to finish this conversation uh, with a last question, which focus um, on the ways uh, the critical impulse generated by your presence uh, here uh, can be continued. Dear Professor Davis, what is your vision for the Angela Davis Chair in Frankfurt? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I thought there was already a vision, <laughs> and that is why I was invited. Uh, and I thought that that vision had, had something uh, to do with um, um, you know, critical uh, approaches to feminism. I thought it had to do with intersectionality, I thought it had to do with an interdisciplinarity that moves beyond the academy, an interdisciplinarity that also acknowledges other sites for the production of knowledge. Uh, uh, and I thought, that, um, I thought that it would involve uh, innovative uh, work by um, various figures. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I would like to come and take the classes uh, from the people who are chosen for the, the chair. And, and, and I know that, uh, that there's a lot of excitement here among scholars and activists and scholar activists. So I think that kind of traffic is what uh, I think is really essential uh, because academics can become very myopic and very solipsistic. Uh, so my hope is that there is an openness uh, uh, and uh, that there is a, a kind of um, uh, imagination that allows for the posing of new questions. Uh, uh, I always uh, tell my students that I don't really care so much what information they are able to uh, gather or memorize. I don't care so much what you know. I'm much more concerned with the process of, uh, of, of producing knowledge. I'm much more concerned with your ability to formulate the kinds of questions that are going to lead you in uncharted directions. Thank you very much for the discussion which helped us to deepen the lecture, and thank you very much for the vision. Your microphone is off. It is off. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So, thank you very much for the discussion, which helped us to deepen parts of the lecture, different aspects of it, and thank you very much for this vis vision for uh, the chair, and um, thanks to all the discussions, too. And I would like to give the last words to Barbara Ulrich to close the
So what is there to say? Thank you, thank you, and thank you. I think, uh, dear Angela Davis, you left us with a lot of work to do, with many questions to ask, and hopefully we find some answers during the forthcoming Angela Davis visiting professorships in the forthcoming years. But for all this, we need your support, we need your help. Thank you again for being here, and you still have a few lectures to give next week, or seminars, and I all want to invite you to join us for the reception outside, so you might be able to discuss one, of the question, one or the other of the questions that are probably open now and that you would like to answer in some way. Have a nice evening, and thank you for being here.